Good evening and welcome to Gravitas. I'm Palki Sharma Upadhyay. Let's get started. Do you think that this new government under President Raisi represents the will of the people of Iran? And if people are not there, no positive development is going to occur. Who do they not trust? The managers and decision makers. Of Iran? The answer is clear. You said that neighbors uh, should not meddle and enforce the will of the Afghan people. I want to know which neighbors, according to you, are meddling. All of the neighbors. Including Iran? Yes, Iran, Pakistan. American withdrawal and a botched up withdrawal has pushed Afghanistan towards another civil war. And in fact, they have new plots been designed and they are supporting the Taliban. The government in Kabul has been accusing Pakistan of supporting Taliban terrorists. Anybody in any part of the world tries to force upon others its will by weapons and arms is going to be a serious threat and danger to uh, all nations and countries. Under Hassan Rouhani, uh, Iran made a major foreign policy shift, uh, elevating its ties with Beijing. Do you think that will have a bearing on Iran's relationships with other partners, including India? Our cooperation between Iran and India is far uh, what the capacity of the contract between Iran and China is now. Yesterday, Rion broke the story of India's Foreign Minister S.J. Shankar going to Tehran for the swearing-in ceremony of the next president, Ibrahim Raisi. Tonight, we bring you an exclusive interview with the former president of the same country, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, a firebrand leader who was barred from contesting this election in Iran. He came to India as president back in 2008. He pushed for energy projects with India. And today he said that Iran's partnership with India has more potential than its engagements with China. In fact, he said the $400 billion program between Tehran and Beijing is a matter of debate in Iran. And the Iranian people look at the Chinese deal with doubt. He also spoke about Pakistan and its role in destabilizing in Afga Afghanistan. He spoke about America and its relationship with the Taliban. Also the crises in his own country, from the drought to the pandemic and the dwindling economy. There's a lot for the incoming leader to deal with. These are challenges for President Raisi when he takes charge. But the biggest challenge, according to former President Ahmadinejad, is regaining the trust of the Iranian people. We'll bring you excerpts on the show. Also on Gravitas tonight, China is on top of the Olympics medal tally, yet Chinese winners are being branded traitors. All thanks to Beijing's brand of toxic nationalism. We'll explain. Why is North Korea suddenly keen on talks? Reports say Kim Jong-un will discuss denuclearization in return for fine liquor and suits. Talk about priorities. The pandemic has meant bad news for businesses the world over, unless you're in the business of technology. A special report on how big tech has grown bigger. We begin, as always, with Gravitas Global Headlines. Amid escalating violence in Afghanistan, the UN assistance mission to the country has said at least 40 civilians have been killed and at least 118 have been injured in the besieged city of Lashkar Gah in the last 24 hours. As tensions rise over the attack on an Israeli-linked tanker, Israel, the United States and the United Kingdom have accused Iran of carrying out the attack. We've conducted a thorough review and we're confident that Iran carried out this attack. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken has vowed collective response and U.K. Prime Minister Boris Johnson has said Iran must face consequences. Meanwhile, Iran says it will respond promptly to any threat against its security. A Belarusian activist living in exile in Ukraine was found hanging in a park in Ukraine's capital, Kiev, a day after being reported missing. Ukrainian police have launched a murder investigation. Vitaly Shishov led a Kiev-based organization that helps Belarusians fleeing persecution. Japan has released the names of three people who broke quarantine rules after returning from overseas. 
threatening its citizens with public shaming and naming if they fail to comply with coronavirus border control measures. Travelers from overseas, including its own citizens, need to self-quarantine for two weeks. At least 3,000 Ethiopian refugees have reportedly fled into Sudan this week, following the spread of the war in Ethiopia's Tigray to the neighboring Amara region. According to the Sudanese authorities, thousands of Ethiopian refugees crossed the border last week. Palestinians called for change as they rallied in Ramallah city to denounce President Mahmoud Abbas following the arrest and death in custody of activist Nizar Banat last month. Indian markets have recorded their sharpest intraday gains in three months. The Nifty hit 16,000 for the first time, while the Sensex was up over 500 points at 53,451. Turkish firefighters continue to battle devastating wildfires with 16 planes and 51 helicopters racing against time to tackle the blazes in three coastal towns. The European Union has said it had helped mobilize three firefighting planes to help the Turkish crews. Norway's Carsten Warholm became the first man to breach the 46-second mark as he stormed to the 400-meter hurdles gold at the Tokyo Olympics. Warholm's great rival, Rai Benjamin of the US, also finished half a second under the existing world record, but was relegated to silver. Meanwhile, Jamaican Elaine thompson hera became the first woman to complete the sprint double at successive Olympics after a gold in the 200 meters to add to her 100 meter victory. The Indian men's hockey team will fight for the bronze medal at the Tokyo Olympics after a defeat to world champions Belgium in the semi-finals. India had fought back from an early goal down to lead 2-1, but the Red Lions scored three goals in the final quarter to win 5-2 and enter a second consecutive Olympic final, where they will face Australia for the gold. India will take on Germany in the bronze playoff on Thursday. We begin tonight with an exclusive interview. We've spoken to the former president of Iran, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. Why is this significant? And four days from now, Ibrahim Raisi will take oath as the eighth president of Iran. Today, he was officially endorsed as Iran Supreme, by Iran Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei. Indian External Affairs Minister S.J. Shankar will travel to Tehran for the swearing-in. Raisi enters office at an extremely challenging time for his country. The economy is in a bad shape. The pandemic is making life difficult. There's an acute water shortage. Thousands of people have taken to the streets. They accuse the government of Iran of failing to provide basic necessities. The challenges for Raisi are many. And now a former president is speaking against him, saying that he must first restore national trust. We're talking about former president Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, the man who served as Iran's president from 2005 to 2013, the original hardliner of Iran, who rapidly advanced Tehran's nuclear program to challenge the West. We spoke to him earlier today. Ahmadinejad has serious doubts about the incoming government and about its credibility. He says the economy and the pandemic have been mismanaged. He also casts doubts on Iran's dealings with China, saying the partnership with India has far more potential. He spoke about Pakistan's role in Afghanistan and America's relationship with the Taliban. Here are excerpts from the conversation I had with him earlier today. Mr. President, welcome to Vion. Thank you very much. You wanted to contest this election yourself, but you were barred from contesting, barred from running. And uh, I understand you did not even vote in this election. In an earlier interview, you've said, and I'm quoting, uh, that you will not participate in the election if the will of the millions of people is denied for no legitimate reason, like it has been in the past. Do you think that this new government under President Raisi represents the will of the people of Iran? Everywhere, things are based on people and uh, the energy that propels the country and uh, takes it forward is the will of the people. And if people are not there, no positive development is going to occur. The governments are entitled to nothing but propelling and developing the will of the people. I agree. 
And yet I repeat my question. Do you think that this new government represents the will of the people of Iran? I made my reply. What are the, the challenges, do you believe, that the Iranian leadership faces uh, and, and should be their priority? Right now, both the economic situation and social situation is in a dire one, and also relations with neighbors and international relations are facing serious challenges. And above all, the distrust and the public. Distrust of whom? Of the public. Who do they not trust? The people. They don't trust the managers and decision makers. Of Iran? The answer is clear. So you're saying that the people of Iran do not trust the decision makers of the, of, of the country. I'm assuming that means the government. The people of Iran are also protesting. Uh, we've been reporting on major crises uh, unfolding in Iran, a serious water shortage, power cuts, people taking to the streets, and some of them have been fired upon by the security forces. What do you make of the situation? The most important issue is the restoration of the national trust, which needs to occur. How do you assess the impact of the pandemic on Iran? And do you think the government uh, has done a good job in uh, ensuring that the impact is minimal? Unfortunately, the government's management of the pandemic has been very, very bad. And today we have uh, public dissatisfaction because of this. I, above the COVID, the weak management has damaged Iran's economy. Another developing story in the region is Afghanistan. Iran is trying to play the role of a mediator in Afghanistan. First of all, how do you assess the way things are going? I think the situation in Afghanistan is both to the detriment of the Afghan nation and also to that of uh, all the regional nations. Anybody who is willing to help should do uh, their best to ensure that the will of the Afghan nation is implemented. And this is going to occur when the real representatives of the Afghan nation make the decisions. Agreement between groups does not bring about any peace, but rather it is a division, dividing of power. What brings about peace, tranquility and security is uh, the enforcement of the public will of the Afghan nation and their neighboring regional countries. Uh, ultra regional states uh, should not meddle uh, First, but they should help the will of the Afghan people. You said that neighbors enforce the will of the Afghan people. I want to know which neighbors, according to you, are meddling. All the neighbors. Including Iran? Yes, Iran, Pakistan, India, China, and the um, Persian Gulf countries, NATO, and Russia. None of them should meddle in the Afghan nations at first. Do you think uh, talking to the Taliban uh, and, and striving towards this peace deal was a good idea, legitimizing the Taliban? When you say that the will of the Afghan people, some say that the Taliban are also Afghan people. Others say that the Taliban are not a legitimate uh, entity, political entity. The people of Afghanistan should uh, elect their representatives, and none of these groups are the representatives of the people of Afghanistan. And this is only possible in a and through a free election. If any group takes weapons and attacks and occupies some parts, cannot consider themselves the representative of the nation and also the, um, and entitled to rights. If we accept this kind of logic, then we will be accepting that the entire world would uh, always be unstable and whoever is more violent would be dominant. Then rights and laws would be meaningless. I agree. In an ideal world, there should be election, but the uh, situation in Afghanistan is not conducive to holding an election, as you would be aware. Do you believe that the American withdrawal and a botched-up withdrawal, as we've been calling it, has pushed Afghanistan towards another civil war? If the U.S. and others don't support the Taliban by providing weapons and also providing logistic, financial and promotion-wise in, in, in uh, regard to the Taliban, then the Taliban would not be able to endanger the security of Afghanistan. And if the Americans and others go away and keep out of this, problems would 
more quickly be resolved. I believe that the Americans have, in practice, not gone out of the region. And in fact, they have a new plot has been designed, and they are supporting the Taliban. And in the near future, the Taliban will resort to the slogan of the great Horasan and bring about a war and conflict to the entire region. You're saying the Americans are supporting the Taliban? It is definitely so. And in fact, the Taliban is part of the American plot. What do you make of Pakistan's role? The government in Kabul has been accusing Pakistan of supporting Taliban terrorists uh, as they try to take control of the territory. What I said is um, addressing everybody. All those who are supporting the Taliban should know that if the Taliban is settled down and takes power, uh, they would soon revolt against themselves and endanger their security. Is that for Pakistan? Yes, surely it is. Anybody in any part of the world who considers themselves as um, the basis and uh, the symbol of a religion and tries to force upon others its will by weapons and arms is going to be a serious threat and danger to uh, all nations and countries. As president of Iran, you visited India and you pushed for what was called the peace pipeline. How do you see the relationship between Tehran and New Delhi as of today? I think uh, we belong to a joint cultural domain and our areas for proximity are very, very much so. Uh, the volume of uh, communications that we have today compared to our capacity and commonality is extremely small. And as a fundamental strategy, we need to do our best to um, ensure that we have we utilize the maximum available capacity. We love the people of India very much. When we travel to India, we feel we are at home. The people of India are extremely um, intimate. They are extremely lovely. They are so kind and also justice-seeking. And the cultural proximities are shared among the two nations and are very different. Do you believe the new administration is going to take forward ties with India? I think it's a strategy that the two countries need to pursue and there is no other way except this. Under Hassan Rouhani, uh, Iran made a major foreign policy shift, uh, elevating its ties with Beijing. Uh, there was a $400 billion accord that was signed that dictates the roadmap of Iran's relationship with China for the next 25 years. Uh, do you think that will have a bearing on Iran's relationships with other partners, including India? In Iran, there's been a lot of debate over that contract and it's ongoing. I think that the potential of uh, cooperation between Iran and India is far, uh, actually more, is much more than um, what the capacity of the contract between Iran and China is now being discussed. So how do you see this uh, growing proximity with China? In relationships, it is the basis that all uh, nations and countries have relations with each other and utilize the maximum potentials. But I believe that uh, the capacity that exists between Iran and India is much higher than uh, relationships with uh, other countries. Chinese investment in various countries has been met with skepticism and uh, increasing debt. Do you think that's a threat that Iran should worry about? As I said before, in any agreement, justice and respect should be observed and the rights of the two parties should be balanced. Uh, regarding the China deal, um, no clear information has been published in Iran, and that's why the Iranian people look at it with doubt. Interesting. You're a politician, but you speak like a diplomat. Nonetheless, it was a pleasure talking to you, Mahmoud Ahmed Nijad. Thank you very much for being with us. Please convey my warm and special uh, greetings to the lovely people of India. Post the First World War, 
boundaries in Europe had to be redrawn. New countries had to be created. That was the price of peace in those times. Now, in the middle of a pandemic, the Afghan Taliban wants the country's president to step down. It is the price of peace, as quoted by a terror group. Peace, you see, is an expensive commodity. That is, unless you happen to be looking at North Korea. There, the Supreme Leader is happy exchanging peace for fine liquor. Our next story is neither about Austria-Hungary nor the Taliban. It is about Kim Jong-un, the dictator of North Korea. He is ready to talk denuclearization in exchange for fine liquor and suits. North Korean dictator Kim Jong-un is in a fix. His country has been overrun by the pandemic, drowned by floods and overwhelmed by a food crisis. Even after military and emergency reserves were released, Pyongyang found itself one million tons short on rice. Misery stricken, Kim was forced to re-engage with the world. In July, North Korea restored hotlines with the South. One of the first messages was addressed to the United States. What did it say? North Korea is ready to restart denuclearization talks, but not without conditions. Pyongyang said the U.S. must first lift sanctions. This includes the ban on metal exports, import of refined fuel, luxury goods, fine liquor and suits. We are talking Armani and Bulgari. Who needs luxury in the middle of a crisis? Well, a member of the South Korean Parliamentary Intelligence Committee said, I asked which necessities they want the most. And they said, high-class liquors and suits, which included not just for Kim Jong-un's own consumption, but to distribute to Pyongyang's elite. Will the US open the liquor tap to ensure the flow of conversation? Let's get some context here. North Korea has heaps of sanctions imposed on it. Some are by the United Nations Security Council. Some by the United States. Then there are also sanctions from Japan and South Korea. The ban on luxury goods was imposed by the UN. Can Washington lobby for its removal? Well, not single-handedly. What it can do is lift its own sanctions on North Korea. America has done that in the past. In 2018, there were talks of denuclearization. Kim Jong-un had met then US President Donald Trump in Singapore. The two went for walks and even posed for the shutters. The next year, the two leaders met in Vietnam. There, the talks were cut short. It was all about the sanctions, complained Trump. Reuters reported that Pyongyang wanted all UN sanctions lifted in exchange of partial closure of a nuclear plant. Washington did not agree. And the DPRK leader went back home only to start firing a barrage of missiles. Cut to 2021. Donald Trump is out of office. And a new leader has emerged in Pyongyang, Kim Yo-jung. She is Kim Jong-un's sister and reportedly more unpredictable than him. Under Joe Biden, Washington is looking to explore diplomacy for denuclearization. But a grand bargain is out of the question. The list may not qualify as grand, but that call is for the White House to take. What we can tell you is that lifting of sanctions and denuclearization will not happen overnight. The North and the South will first have to achieve a thaw. The two Koreas have already restored hotlines. Reports suggest a joint liaison office and a summit could be next. And it is only after this that formal talks with Washington could resume. But now North Korea is sending mixed signals. On the one hand, Kim Jong-un is offering talks in exchange of luxury goods. On the other hand, his sister is threatening South Korea. Well, headlines like these won't help Kim Jong-un's seller. Bureau Report, Vion, World is One. Meanwhile, China is struggling with the homecoming of its homemade virus. That's right, the Wuhan virus has once again resurfaced in its country of origin. And this time, it's in the form of the Delta variant, which is said to be spreading rapidly. How rapidly? 
This the Chinese regime won't tell us. What we do know, though, is that the 11 million residents of Wuhan are going to be tested all over again. 11 million of them. The capital, Beijing, has been partially sealed from the rest of the country. At least 27 cities in 18 provinces are reporting new cases. It's an embarrassing moment for China, which was mocking the world with pool parties and celebrations around the same time last year. Wuhan went wild at a pool party. Thousands of revelers packed a water park, dancing to the rhythm of normalcy. The Chinese media sold these images as Communist Party's victory over the virus. One year on, the victory celebration may prove to be premature, and the Chinese media won't discuss it. Look at these images from Wuhan. They were taken on Tuesday morning. Here's a child getting a nucleic acid test for the Wuhan virus, as other residents wait for their turn. The masks have returned, as have face shields. Along with frontline workers back in their PPE kits, people have flooded supermarkets. They are hoarding up once again fearing another draconian lockdown by the authorities. Because this is not just any flare-up. This is being called China's broadest COVID-19 outbreak since the virus first emerged. The epicenter once again is the city of Wuhan. Its year-long streak of no cases has been broken. Local transmissions are on the rise. The numbers are in the hundreds so far. But concerns are growing over the pace at which the virus is spreading. Chinese authorities won't tell you the full picture. Their actions show how serious the situation is. We have decided to quickly conduct nucleic acid testing for all residents in our city to comprehensively screen out positive cases and asymptomatic infections. Yes, Wuhan is once again going to test all of its 11 million residents. Reports say the rest of the country may soon follow suit because the Delta variant is breaking through China's virus defenses. First, this outbreak is caused by the imported Delta variant. This Delta variant has a high viral load, is highly contagious, spreads with a high speed and has a long recovery time. At least 27 cities in 18 provinces are reporting cases. The worst hit are Beijing, Zhengzhou, Nanjing and Zhangjiajie. In Nanjing, authorities have tested 9.2 million and put thousands under lockdown. In Zhangjiajie, authorities are trying to track 5,000 people who attended super spreader events. The virus has breached highly protected Beijing too. The city has been partially sealed. No one from regions reporting new infections is being allowed to enter the capital. The homemade virus has come back home, but in a different form. The question is, will the homemade vaccines work? State-owned Sinopharm says its shot is just 68% effective against Delta. And Sinovac, the other major supplier, says its vaccine has neutralized the Delta strain, but in laboratory studies only. China finds itself in a rather embarrassing state. All its claims about conquering the virus have fallen flat. Bureau Report, we on World is One. China's troubles don't end with the virus homecoming. There's a bigger problem to the South. Hostile visitors in the South China Sea, the latest one, is a perceived partner of Beijing, a country that was once on the fence, until now that is. We're talking about Germany. Germany has uh, sent a ship to the South China Sea. Why is this significant? 
Reason number one, this deployment revives German interest in the South China Sea. Their last voyage through here was in 2002, nearly two decades back. Reason number two, Germany was considered non-committal on China. They wanted competition, not conflict, mostly because China is Germany's largest trading partner. So Berlin is putting a lot at stake with this voyage. Reason number three, Germany is linking up with regional allies. The frigate is not making a voyage for the sake of it. It will mo make stops in Japan, South Korea, Australia and Vietnam, basically meet up with the alliance of democracies. Does this mean that Germany is officially on board? Not quite. The voyage will stick to traditional shipping routes. It won't breach China's red line. So no venturing into the Taiwan Strait or sailing near disputed islands. Plus, the Germans want a port visit in Shanghai. They filed a request with China and got a stiff reply. Explain your intentions in South China Sea, then we'll see about the port visit. Now, this is the problem with Germany. They're unwilling to go all in. Even this mission is a small miracle. No one expected Angela Merkel to approve it. She's always favored talks and settlements. But Merkel's leadership is set to end. Her allies see China as a threat to German sovereignty and interests. Reports say the port call in Shanghai was added to get Merkel on board. But half-hearted or not, this deployment has symbolic value. Germany is the biggest economy in Europe. It has the power to influence European policy. So Berlin's realignment is certainly a message to China. Has Beijing received the message? Well, it has. Instead of responding, though, China has opted for denial. This is their latest editorial hit job in the Global Times. UK, Germany seek balance with warship transits in South China Sea despite US pressure. It's clear what China is trying to do here. Playing down these missions, it says Germany and Britain are not acting independently. They're wilting under American pressure. It's a good argument. But is China convincing itself or the world with this? Trade alone will not keep Europe on the fence, not for long. The Democratic Alliance is brainstorming new trade routes, new and reliable supply chains. So China's leverage is significantly smaller now. Also, this is not a West, Western maritime crusade. The regional powers are very much involved. I'm talking about countries like India. The Indian Navy is deploying a task force of its eastern fleet to the South China Sea. The ships will set off in early August. Over two months, they will visit Southeast Asia, the South China Sea, and the Western Pacific. This is how India described its objective, and I'm quoting, deployment of Indian Navy ships seeks to underscore the operational reach, peaceful presence, and solidarity with friendly countries towards ensuring good order in the maritime domain and to strengthen existing bonds between India and countries of the Indo-Pacific. China has not reacted to India's plans yet, but rest assured, they will be livid. This Indian voyage cannot be dismissed as American pressure. New Delhi has direct stakes in the region. It does not need a nudge from the US to sail in these waters. Put together, it's all bad news for China at the moment. The Wuhan virus is making a homecoming tour. Their so-called maritime backyard has become a global common and perceived partners are abandoning ship. It's true what they say about democracy. It is slow and imperfect. But it prevails. And that's exactly what the Alliance of Democracies is doing, moving slowly but surely. Our next story is from Afghanistan. Throughout history, the Panjshir province in Afghanistan's northeast has fearlessly banded together and resisted occupying forces. This includes the Soviets in the 1980s and the Taliban in the 1990s. Decades later, a tenacious Taliban is once again at its doorstep. Government forces in the province are overwhelmed. So the Panchiris have taken it upon themselves to protect their land. Our correspondent Anas Malik traveled to the Panchir province. He sent us this report today. Some former Mujahideen warlords who fought beside Panjshiris against the Taliban are promising to revive their militias. The entrance to the city of Panjshir, it is manned by the Afghan army. This area has historically always repulsed the Taliban.
The scenic Panjshir Valley also serves as a tourist spot for the people of Afghanistan, who would often flock to the lush valley with the mighty Panjshir River flowing along rugged mountains to spend their weekend. The river that flows right behind me is known as the river of Panjshir. Panjshir, the name literally translates into five lines. It is the home to Ahmed Shah Masood, who is commonly known as the Lion of Panjshir. Panjshir has always resisted oppressive regimes, including that of the Taliban. The Taliban have only dreamt of taking over the entire territory. They've never even been able to take a single district. Panjshir is perhaps one of the most beautiful districts in the entire Afghanistan. Resentful at how many Panjshiris and other strongmen of the old US-backed Northern Alliance were marginalized by President Hamid Karzai, they want their weapons back. When in the past Taliban had come to Afghanistan, 90% was with them, whereas the 10% was with the government, and that 10% was Panjshir and Kabul. Back then, Panjshir was just another area, now it's a district. When back then the people of Panchi stood in front of the Taliban, then why not now? Around Panjshir, the headquarters of the former Northern Alliance, where Ahmad Shah Masood used to live, hundreds of volunteers have taken up arms to protect their homes. And knowingly or not, the business interests of local warlords and power brokers who are organizing a militia movement. These volunteers are trained at the riverbank of the Panjshir River. Our youngsters are training to fight. We are doing this so that our country can be defended because our leader Ahmad Shah Masood did the same for his country. All the youngsters are doing this because of their love and commitment to the soil. These recent conflict-ridden weeks have seen local militias spurred by Afghan leaders arming and regrouping, much in the way of how Afghanistan fell into civil war in the 1990s. Sons are being trained by their fathers to fight the Taliban. The way how our elders fought earlier, we the youngsters are now being trained in the same manner to safeguard our country. Since the past one month, we are being trained in a military manner, so we are 100% ready to defend our country. We have taken up these arms the same way our fathers did to fight terrorists and we want to fight terrorists too. We are 100% ready so that when the Taliban come, we will give them a befitting response. Almost every day, elders sit in the office of Ahmad Shah Masood to discuss strategy, current situation and their would-be response so that when the time comes, they are not caught off guard. With Anas Malik in Panjshir, Bureau Report, we on World is One. The last 20 months of this pandemic have been emotionally and financially crippling for millions. But for tech titans, they've brought a dramatic reversal of fortune. I'm talking about the likes of Apple, Google and Amazon. They've become bigger than they already were with profits that go up to several billion dollars and a double digit growth rate in their net income. How did they do it? Well, thanks to you. Our next report explains. When the COVID-19 pandemic hit us, thousands of businesses were thrown into chaos. The disruption was massive. It appeared like everyone would suffer. 20 months into it, we have some winners. Big tech has grown bigger. On Tuesday, Apple revealed that it earned $21.7 billion in the last three months. 21.7 billion dollars that's almost double the 11.2 billion dollars it earned in the same period last year over the last quarter the company made 40 billion dollars by selling iphones only this is significantly more than the 26.4 billion dollars it made during the same period last year 
other big tech giants are having an amazing time as well. Take Microsoft, for example. It reported a net income of $16.5 billion last week. That is an almost 50% increase from the $11.2 billion it reported same time last year. The coffers of Google's parent company are swelling up as well. Alphabet Inc. has reported an astonishing 166% increase in net income compared to last year. It has reported a net income of $18.5 billion for the last three months compared to $6.96 billion earned during the same time frame in 2020. And then we have Facebook. The social networking site has also doubled its quarterly net income, earning $10.3 billion in the last three months compared with an earning of $5.2 billion last year. Its peers are minting money. How could Amazon be an exception? The e-commerce giant continues its record-breaking growth. On the 29th of July, Amazon reported a 50% increase in its quarterly net income, earning $7.8 billion in the last three months, compared to $5.2 billion during the same time. The fact is, the pandemic has made tech giants and their bosses unfathomably rich. The question is, how did they do it? The answer is, they did not. Their customers did. How exactly? By making tech companies their lifelines during lockdowns. Take home shopping, for example. It went from an occasional indulgence to a safety necessity during the pandemic. People used Amazon excessively to get items they could not go to a store for. The same for socializing. People used Facebook and Instagram to catch up with their friends and family. As schools went virtual, families bought laptops and tablets for online learning. And with strict lockdowns, any business that still had money to spend, spent it on ads on Google and Microsoft platforms. All of this might seem too obvious now, but it wasn't necessarily a year ago. The habits that we adopted were in some sense exactly what the tech giants had hoped to create for us. And it shows in their earnings reports. Bureau Report, we on World is One. With that, it's a wrap. We're leaving you as always with Gravitas Images. Thanks for watching.